Hello and welcome Balticon attendees. Uh, we're going to be talking about generational changes in fandom and we're so thrilled that you've joined us this morning. But before we dive into that very big topic, I'd love to have our uh, panelists introduce themselves, please, starting with Alyssa. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Alyssa Winans. I'm the artist guest of honor for this weekend. I'm an illustrator, sometimes animator and game artist living in the SF Bay area. And I am somewhat new to the con scene. So I'm here representing that. Daniel? Hi, uh, I'm Dan Kimmel. I'm a, a film critic based in Boston. Uh, I guess we're gonna save our, our plugs of our books to the end. Uh, I guess I should mention, uh, besides doing uh, film reviews, I also write humorous science fiction. I've had uh, three novels out. Uh, but I, I came into fandom uh, in my 30s, which is uh, relatively late compared to some people. And we'll talk, I could talk about that. Okay, Jay? I'm Jay Smith. I'm a writer, podcaster, and audio playwright. Uh, I got into fandom back in the 70s. I was into Dungeons and Dragons and Star Wars when it wasn't cool to be in either of those groups. Uh, and I endured the public school system as a, as a result of my, my interests. So. And I'm Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce. As Gail, I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, near future, post-apocalyptic uh, fiction and more. And as Morgan, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. I'm also the con runner for Continual, the online ongoing multi-genre convention that never ends. And I'm a staff writer for the Winchester Family Business, which is the largest fan-run supernatural fan uh, page on the internet. I've been in fandom since my late teens, uh, which was back in the late 70s. I also played D&D &D back when it was still a satanic cult. And uh, that was a joke, folks. And uh, so, yeah, I've been knocking around geekdom for a very long time. And it's been a wild and crazy ride. Now, everyone has mentioned in their introduction when your uh, first glimpse of that geekdom came, but how did you find out about this thing called fandom? Uh, how, did, how did it first get on your radar? Jay? Uh, my mom worked at a, a uh, pharmacy and, and uh, lunch counter, and they had a spindle rack of comic books. And so every time I would come home from school and, and check in with my mom, I'd get a comic book to go home and, and read until she was off work. My older brother was into Dungeons and Dragons and he's my older brother. So anything he was doing was cool. So I got into that and, and uh, Star Wars, you couldn't avoid it. it. It was a cultural phenomenon. And if you weren't into it, it was the one thing that geek kids could do that didn't make them a target back in those days where I grew up. So uh between that and the chris claremont x-men era and this that that first movement of gen x making geekdom legit i was there as a kid okay dan well i, I come at it from a as a journalist because i was reading and watching science fiction since i was a little kid i um uh, you know, I knew about this thing called fandom out there, you know, like I would read a book, the Hugo winners. So I knew there was this thing out there, but I had no idea where it was or how to get involved. And this, this was, has been one of my longstanding complaints of fandom. We do a terrible job publicizing ourselves. I was living in the back bay of Boston. The 19, I think it was 82 world con was literally blocks from my front door. I had no idea what was going on there. It wasn't until 89 when I was now a journalist and the Worldcon came back to Boston and I was there uh, as a member of the press. That was my first introduction to, to organized fandom. And I wandered around the place because I had a, a pass and I said, these people are insane. Where do I sign up? I have to laugh because the closed captioning called it the World Cup, which is a very different event. <laughs> And Alyssa, you have uh, told us that you're new to the game. Uh, how did you find out this thing called fandom existed? Well, I might be a little bit inaccurate on that. So I'm new to sort of the fan slash writing side of things and just like fandom kind of in that way. But 
growing up, my parents were really into fantasy and sci-fi, but they were just in isolation on it. Like they never seemed to talk to anybody about it or go anywhere or do anything with it. But I read all those books growing up because they're just in our house. Um, and then when I became an artist, I was kind of seeing like the fantasy art side of things because I was a fantasy artist, but it wasn't until I was nominated for the Hugos last year that suddenly I realized this whole side of thing existed and it's huge. Um, so that's all been kind of, I like opened the door and there's a whole world back there. I, um, I, I loved Star Wars, the, the original movie when it came out, I saw it 15 times in the theater because of course back then we didn't have DVDs. If it, when it left town eventually, who knew if you'd ever get to see it again. So you wanted to see it as many times as you could. I fell into uh, Star Trek, the original series in kind of reruns. Uh, it wasn't that long off the series, but it had been a while and I just got obsessed with it. And everybody knew that I liked this stuff. So somebody said, hey, you know, there's going to be some sort of get together for those shows you like in Pittsburgh, which was not terribly far. And um, I was in high school, went down to Pittsburgh. It was a very small convention, uh, certainly small by today's standards. And uh, we can talk later about how conventions have changed, but I walked in there and there was the vendor room and I could buy an Idic necklace and I could buy Starfleet patches and I could buy pictures and without social media and Amazon, none of this stuff was easily accessible. And I was just bowled over and, and then I could talk to people and they got the jokes and they, they saw the same shows and they could complete the quote. And I was just, you know, it was like, wow, these are my people. I have, I have, I thought I was all by myself. Like, this is just a wonderful thing. So I, it just changed my life seriously because here I am doing it for a living. Um, what were conventions or the, your first experience with this sort of event? What were they like when you first came into uh, fandom, Dan? Well, the first one that I, where I was actually a participant was a, a, a Boscone. Uh, there's a Boston area convention. Oh, and this, at that time, they were in exile in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I was put on a panel and I made the classic newbie mistake. I, was a, I, I forget what the, the subject was. It was obviously something on movies that I could talk about. But I'm looking at the program and I see there's no moderator listed. And I go, so who's the moderator of this panel? And they all simultaneously look at me and go, you are. And fortunately, I was a college professor. And so I knew how to run a room and I, I got through it. But that was, it was sort of like baptism by fire at my first convention. <laughs> okay, Jay? Uh, conventions really didn't come to Central PA until Next Generation took off. So those were the very commercial, uh, you pack as many vendors into a room as possible. Uh, all of them comic vendors. And we didn't have a whole lot of merchandise back then, a few, few action figures here and there. So it created what, what we affectionately called in the area butt crack alley, because you would go into the vendor room and there's 10 guys down looking through the, the dollar book bins. And that was their thing for the whole day. And it wasn't a pretty sight, but there was always one or two celebrities from Star Trek there. And that was like Hollywood visiting central PA. So John Delancey was talking about alien voices coming up in his program. Cole Meany had a line a hundred strong and everybody had this unique energy because it wasn't something that you you had where we came from if you were in new york you were in a larger city obviously um so i was turned on to that and i i i, I was in a, in a journalism program at that point in college and i just wanted to i, I kind of wanted to go like um like the grateful dead i wanted to follow these conventions and interview the people who were, were all just fascinated by this and that didn't pan out well, but I got to know a lot of people in fandom and we all realized that without this communal, this, this centralized force, we never would have met each other. We never would have, our lives wouldn't have been enriched so much. Uh, so back then it was just dealer room and, and speakers. Now it's just this wonderful community that has blossomed because of, now it's acceptable. Well, and I think a key thing to mention or reiterate there is this was before social media. This was before finding fandom merchandise on Etsy or Amazon. Uh, this was before most of it was even licensed. 
So the tie-in novels were very, very new. Star Trek started doing that with some of them, but uh, that was very new. So there wasn't the proliferation of stuff, let alone abilities to connect um, that we have now. I ran a fanzine back in uh, about uh, 79 to 81, which was, you got a bunch of people together that you had met at a convention, you traded mailing addresses because nobody had email. You put together, people wrote fan, uh, fan fiction or did fan art, you Xeroxed it, stapled it together. People paid you for it, you put it in envelopes and mailed it to them. And that was a key thing between these events for the fandom being able to keep in touch, except out on maybe, not in the early 80s, but later on, some computer bulletin boards and some geeky things like that. Um, it really worked with sort of a mailing system to stay in touch and find out what was going on. Alyssa, this is ancient history for you, I know, but uh, you've certainly been to different types of art events. Um, so maybe, a comment on how fan events are different from others. Um, I mean, I loved hearing what you all just said because a lot of the things that you mentioned, like the like fan art and the merchandise and stuff, like I always accepted that as totally normal growing up. Like I've been to like a few art conventions and of course it's like all fan art and it's all very available and accessible and things like that. Um, it does seem like depending on the type of art convention you go to, it will be tailored to different people. So there's definitely events that are more tailored specifically to artists and people learning art. Um, and they they kind of pretend it's more for fans, but actually like when you talk to the people there, it's largely folks in the industry. And then there's, I think like more of the comic conventions that does have more of a fan presence. Um, but again, you'll still find creators mixed in there. Um, I've kind of been to a little of both, but just as a not like actually part of the community because I didn't really talk to anybody except for like the creators at their tables. But um, it's it's very interesting hearing about the stapled zines because like on social media now they do the same thing. They're like, let's fan like source this stuff and print it and mail it, um, which is kind of amazing that it's all still the same in one regard. It, it's a lot easier to deliver a, a digital zine now and and I haven't, I haven't written fan fiction for decades uh, because I, I write published stuff, but I still read it. And um, yeah, that, that is still alive and well out there, but it's got a long, long tradition. Um, I think to understand some of the generational aspects that I wanna get into in a little bit, we do need to talk about the different types of conventions. There are literary conventions like Boscone, which leans that way. There are more multimedia conventions uh, like Balticon and DragonCon. And then there are the more vendor oriented conventions like the Comic-Cons uh, or all of the things that are Comic-Cons that can no longer call themselves Comic-Cons. Um, and I think that that, and then there are the fan run conventions versus the completely um, professionally run conventions like um, DragonCon is still a fan run convention, the creation conventions for Supernatural and Lucifer and some of those properties are run um, very well, but with a very slick professional uh, piece to it. And it, there's a different feel. So um, Jay, do you wanna comment on, on maybe some of the different types of conventions you've encountered as an attendee or as a, a, a guest? Um, well, the, the comic book conventions of, of old were pretty much just a, a commercial transaction get them in and sell product uh and those i have really no interest in because they're really stuffy and they, they just want to move people and, and get tickets um literary conventions as part of my master's program i go i we have a program called in your right mind which we do we do every year uh brings in authors from outside publishers agents and whatnot and we, we talk about the craft and that that brings in a different audience, people who love to read and people who love to write. And it's usually a more, uh, there's more of a, a detailed discussion of, of writing and art in general. I love those because I, I just love to go and sit and talk to other creators and get inside their head and let them get inside mine. Uh, and I think those are the two main ones. The pop culture conventions, I've been to Dragon Con where it's just a sea of, of humanity. Uh, and I, I've, 
I can say it's like a, it, it's like an amusement park. You, you don't know what you're going to see walking around the corner. There's somebody there's like a nine foot guy on stilts and a horror mask and he's selling a virtual reality technology. I can go to a completely different building and talk about the future of robotics and stuff like that. So it's not one thing. It's almost an experience you have to prepare yourself for. Uh, but then there's the intimate um, anime and cosplay cons like Zenkai Con in, in Pennsylvania, where it's a family that comes together and they share their, what they've what they've made, what they've sewn, what they're wearing, uh, and it's just a celebration of of a specific subgenre. So there are different moods. Uh, the newer ones that come out that it, it's I guess it's now cost effective to in order to put on a con convention for a subgenre or a sub subgenre. And that's great to see because it, it just enhances all of our experiences. There's just a lot of ways that us as general fans can broaden our horizon because thank God COVID's over. We can, we're can we now going to go back to a model where if you know there's going to be a new convention somewhere near you next week that you can learn something new and get involved in some new uh, fan experience. Mm -hmm. um, Dan? Well, I, I tend not to go to the, the specialized cons, but... Once I started publishing uh, science fiction uh, and in science fiction publications, I, I spread out to more of the, the regional cons. And they have different sizes, different flavors. Something like Alba Con in upstate New York is a very small and intimate con. It's like two tracks of paneling. And basically, you know, if they, we're going to do an ice cream party on Friday night and everybody at the convention fits into the one room. And then I've gone to a, a big world con and to me, I knew I had arrived about oh, less than 10 years that I was going to local cons when I showed up at a world con and started running into people I knew. And that, you know, but on the, the flip side of that is at, at these um, multimedia cons, you know, like I, I'm with books, I'm with movies, I, I, but there were so many different worlds and conventions of costuming and filking and art show and you know all these different things that I have nothing to do with. I respect them, and I but I, I tell people a group of friends could go to a convention and be booked the entire weekend and come out and they've done nothing in common because especially at the Worldcon level there was just so much stuff going on. Yeah, I mean, I've I've done certainly the regional cons uh, like Confluence in Pittsburgh and um, a number of other cons that size, which are maybe a few hundred people, like you said, Dan, a couple of uh, panel tracks. It's, all, it's got an art room. It's got uh, a vendor room, but the, the feel is very small and intimate, and it's very much a gathering of friends and some new folks each year, but there, there's a core of people who know each other. Mm. Um, I've been a guest at DragonCon for over a decade. That's 90,000 of your closest friends packed mm. into every hotel in downtown Atlanta and the convention center. And it's, it's not just authors. It's got, um, like, like Dan mentioned, it's got science tracks and robotic tracks and, and computer tracks and um, all, all kinds of stuff per every little fandom. You go to a um, New York Comic Con, um, I was on a panel there and panels are very scarce and tagged to major properties. Um, it's mostly the vendor room. And that's true also with other kinds of comic conventions where the big thing is the vendor room. You might have a few panels off to the other side. You might have some signings, but it's, it's really, People come to buy stuff. Um, and then you have the things like the creation entertainment conventions where the only people on panels are the stars of the show. And those are set up a little differently depending on the show and its vibe. But you really have the star panels, a little bit of merchandise, and then uh, fans getting together with fans. I have no idea how that translates on the art side of things, Alyssa. <laughs> well, first off, I have to say that I wonder how artists find out about all of these conventions, because I knew some of those that you all just mentioned, but a lot of them I didn't. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering, you know, who's being marketed to with these conventions. Um, I do, I've only tabled at two conventions before, um, so I don't know if I can speak as an expert to all these different kinds of things, but I do know, having talked to a lot of artists, I think 
the scale of the show really makes a big difference in how people approach it. So like I've only done very small things. So, you know, I, I get a bunch of prints in a box that I can carry to the building, which is a very different experience than if you're a sculptor and you have to mail your bronzes across the country to a more fine art heavy show where you really have to show your original work. Um, and then also compared to, I guess, if you're going to something like Dragon Con, which I assume the volume of everything that you have to prepare is really unbelievable. And you have to prep for months in advance and like just ship everything. Um, but I have not a lot of personal experience there, so. Have you been to, to physical conventions or have you only done the online so far? Um, so the two that I've been to like as a, a tabling artist, one was a local small Comic-Con and then another was a more art centric Lightbox Expo down in Southern California. Okay. When so I was a person, but stuck behind a table the whole time. When you go, when we were all back at regular conventions, you will find that there are fan tables with flyers of all these upcoming conventions. And, and you could just go through and take all these, and go, oh, I, I, my mother lives near here. I want to go to this convention or, oh, I've always wanted to visit this place. And that's one way you find out about these other conventions. Well, and, and you know, you bring up a good idea, a good point on, I, mean, I failed to mention the online conventions, which while we've done them out of necessity during the current unpleasantness, I think that there are a lot of pluses people have found to them in terms of being able to uh, help both creators and professionals and attendees be part of a convention where maybe distance or cost or physical mobility or other aspects might have kept them from attending. It's really broadened our uh, base and broadened who can participate. So I'm, I'm hoping that that doesn't go away, uh, but, but continues to augment after we can go back to full in-person events. And, and that's certainly the thought behind founding Continual is it's meant to be continual. Um, now, some of us have been in fandom long enough to remember some of the stigma that came with being a geek back before geeks sort of won the war with all the blockbuster movies. Um, some folks fortunately got spared that. But um, how does that, how did that affect the convention vibe back in the day? And is it something that has a legacy in today's convention community. Jay? Um, it reminds me of a story uh, in, at that point in the late eighties, before it became mainstream, conventions that showed up in town were magnets for local news organizations to come out and turn it into a circus. They would come up and they would interview the weirdest person they could find and ask them questions about Star Trek and Star Wars. It would end up being look at the nerd kind of parade. And one of my favorite moments at a Central PA Con was a vendor who was dressed up, it was belly dancing costume, and she was selling wares, and she was very proud of what she did. And one of the local news guys came up to her, it was a live feed, and asked her a, a, really a dumb question. And she turned to him and, and, and just laid into him about, would you disrespect a sports convention like this would you walk into somebody wearing a football outfit and and ridicule them for their choices of on how they spend their weekends no i don't think so and i think the world needs to adjust its attitude toward people who love to express themselves creatively and spontaneously on live television i wish i could find a spot everybody around her burst into applause and cheers and i've never seen a news organization retreat so fast to a lobby and recover it was great it was one of those things where I had everybody wanted to speak to, but there there was always the element at a convention. People would gravitate to the camera just for the exposure, and they would be the dancing monkey for the convention. But I think in '89 that was the turning point when Next Generation was getting high ratings, and all of these uh, syndicated shows were popping up and becoming mainstream entertainment. That was that was when the the wave broke, and we kind of came into our own. But that, that, before that, it was always, you know, you know, look at the guy who's going through the quarter bins at the comic books and the guy dressed up as Spock and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I knew when, the, when I was graduating high school in 1989, when the jocks were making Star Wars and Star Trek references and they were the ones lining up for Batman when it debuted. <laughs> um, and I knew the one thing a professor of mine told me was, 
those of you in maths and sciences, those of you in business who are geeks, you're going to control the finances in the future. So you're going to outnumber those guys and you're going to see the geek culture is going to be more accepted in the future than it is today. Proud that's yeah. true. I think it's funny that Dragon Con always seems to overlap with uh, a major Georgia football game. And what the geeks understand and what the football people don't is that what you really have are two tribal units that don't understand each other. And so we'll come down in our cosplay and they're clutching their children to them like we might make off with them and maybe eat them or something. And they're, they're definitely doing, oh, look at the freaks kind of thing. Meanwhile, they're all dressed in team colors. They're gonna go someplace and paint their face or their body. They're gonna wear a fright wig and wave around a big foam hand. And they don't think that's odd at all. And they don't understand that it is a, it is a fandom of a different sort. We're just doing something else. It, both of them are very legitimate. Don't, don't, nobody's the freak here. Don't yuck somebody's yum. Uh, but it's always funny because they look at us like we're, we're going to do something terrible and, and we just have a big laugh at it. But that's, it's still there, but you're right. It, it's much less than it used to be. Uh, Dan? Yeah, I, I was actually part of that transition of the late 80s into the 90s because I was, a, so I am a journalist. And so I would occasionally have the opportunity to write a, an article that was a preview of a convention or some science fiction event. And I, I, I was at first surprised when I would hear back from either convention organizers or authors that I interviewed saying, wow, that was, that was like the nicest thing anybody's written about us. But it was so respectful. I said, yes, but, you know, because I, I got it. I was, you know, part of it. Uh, but yeah, there was a, a real, uh, a real vibe in the media of, you know, hey, wait, let's make fun of the geeks. But when, you know, you look at the, uh, the variety top 10 or top 20 of all time, you know, and it's all science fiction and fantasy, or almost all, I guess Titanic's still in there. Um, you know, it's a we're in a different world now. And in, in my my book, Jar Jar Binks Must Die, I have an essay about how you know we we went from the forbidden genre to we won. And you know, we're we're in a different place now. Alyssa, I don't know how much this maps to your experience of changes in the art world, but um, please jump in. Well, I was born in 89, so I'm feeling tremendously privileged to have missed the entire transition period um, You're completely. Uh, thank you to all who came before and fought for <laughs> it. I appreciate it. Um, I think from an art side, so my first encounter with art community, I think, was going to art school. And honestly, everybody there had pretty... I, you could sort of tell I was in the illustration department. So you did see a lot of folks who kind of grew up already watching things on mainstream television, that kind of thing. Like the kids cartoons when I was a kid was already sort of more fantastical. You know, Sailor Moon was big when I was a kid. And that's very like, you know, magical girl type stuff. So I think already by the time I was in college, like everybody around me drawing fantasy art wasn't unusual. You did see some divides uh, in the school of like, folks who did want to do more contemporary illustration, which was a little bit less on that side. So it wasn't like it was just a full department of fantasy nerds. Um, but yeah, it was pretty mainstream. And I think even now, mm, <laughs> the art world is very wide and varied. So uh, I spend most of my time in, in the fantasy side. So I can't say like how we're viewed from the other side. Um, but I do think that there's a lot more mixing than there probably used to be, just because even if you're an artist that doesn't make fantasy art, you're probably still watching all those shows. So you might still like fantasy art, even if it's not something you prefer doing. Um, so definitely a lot of lines are just blurred at this point. A couple comments I wanted to uh, mention from the chat. Um, one comment that fandom really goes way back into the 30s. And of course, uh, some of the conventions like Lunacon, which is no longer with us, uh, stretched back practically to then um, and, and lasted for 50 plus years. Uh, also, another comment about how people found out about fandoms. And somebody mentioned uh, ads in the back of pulp magazines uh, that would tell people about 
the, a convention coming up, knowing that if you were reading a pulp magazine, you were likely to be a, um, you were going to be their audience. Um, I, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about is how the structure of conventions has changed over the years as they became larger, as they became uh, maybe a little more slicker, professional as the world changed. Um, Dan? In, in terms of how, how things have changed, well, uh, we, you know, it's, it's like I've read the history of uh, you know, fandom in the, you know, say like the 40s, 50s, 60s, is, you know, especially when Star Trek came out. What is this media stuff? Are we going to allow ourselves to be sullied by this? And that, and I think now, or in recent years, although this, I think we may have already gotten beyond it, gaming, gaming, is that part of the science fiction world? I, you know, for, for a group that's supposed to be so future oriented, we seem to be very much stuck in the past sometimes. But I think, but we, we evolve. And I, I think the, the successful conventions are the ones that can appeal to all these, these different groups. I mean, I, I go to be on uh, mostly, mostly media panels because I'm a movie critic, but also uh, you know, some of the literary stuff. And one of the things that I think is, is most special about science fiction conventions, and this goes back right to the beginning, is a chance to meet the pros because the pros are fans themselves. And so, you know, like a mainstream author, I'm probably never going to meet, you know, unless there's a book signing at the local Barnes and Noble and I stand in line. But at a science fiction convention, I can be standing next to, you know, I'll say Robert Silverberg, you know, or I, I went to a, 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 a reader con several years ago and got to meet one of my idols, the, the late Octavia Butler. D totally approachable. Have conversations with them and get, get the book autographed. Mm -hmm. Jay? Uh, one of the great things that I think we've adapted to um, a more inclusive and diverse f fan body. Uh, when I first started going, people going to conventions looked like me. And there was the exception to the girlfriend who came along and that, that stereotype. There were very few women, people of color. Um, uh, you had your older audience and you, you, some young people who were trying to you know get into it. But right now, if I go to um, like Balticon is, is a tapestry of people, and it, it's so gratifying to see that fandom is involves everybody. We've got a long way to go to reach out, um, but I, the, the, the first time I went to a major convention, I, I, I have to admit I felt a little territorial. Because at, growing up and feeling like a nerd under those, those conditions, you want to feel like you own or are part of the inner group of something that is yours, right? So I can sort of empathize with the resistance of some people to bring new voices, the new generation, other people, other cultures into. But I think we've done a wonderful job of trying to overcome that. Um, but I definitely, well, the first time I went to Dragon Con, and it was the first time you not only saw people from your community of different walks of life, but around the world who are coming together to, to share their love of a not just one thing, but all things. It was just amazing. So that's a coming from from butt crack alley to Dragon Con and the latest technology and that that that's I think it's profound change since I started. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I was going to say one of the, the things that I like I've been going on at some cons is this multi generational thing. And this panel being an example, I was on a, a panel a couple of years ago on the TV show Riverdale, you know, based on the Archie comics that had you know, somebody like me who was reading Archie comics 50 years ago and somebody who had just gotten into the show like that year, some, somebody who was, I think, maybe in high school. And I thought that was great to have that conversation across the generations. The, the downside of that is when you get a new generation coming in that doesn't, I don't want to say doesn't respect the traditions, but doesn't respect the people who put in all the work to make that convention exist. And all of a sudden, oh, we're, we're different now and start kicking out people. I'm not going to mention names, but there are a couple of conventions that have done that. And I, I find that very disappointing. I think one of the biggest things that I've seen change is a formalization of conventions. And it needed to happen. It needed to happen for security reasons, for the attendees and the guests. It, it needed to happen as they grew. 
um, you can't help but feel a little nostalgic for what you could do when you were a very small crowd. Um, so I remember some of my first conventions the media guests, many of whom were Star Trek actors, and this was before the movie, so they weren't doing a whole lot because the movie they they kind of gotten um, stuck most of them career wise because of Star Trek, and it hadn't taken back off again. So they were showing up to these, and and they would just hang out. We would run into them in the elevator. They weren't they didn't have handlers. They weren't going through the back, you know, hallways. Um, I remember a star from uh, Space 1999 showed up at the room parties to cage the free beer, um, you know, and sat down and, and just talked to people. And you can't have that today. It, it, it's not safe. It, it's, we, there's much more of a divide. But once upon a time, we were all small enough and um, that could happen. So that's one thing that I, I miss, even though I understand why it's not that way anymore. Um, I also encountered conventions that were only for books or that were only for games and people had very distinct fences and uh, opinions. And it's wonderful to see conventions having something for everybody. And you go to a Dragon Con and you've got people who are uh, definitely up in their 70s and 80s. You've also got young parents with children in front carriers, usually dressed up as a character. Um, you know, you've got teenagers, you've got 20 somethings, you've got people in every age and, and they're all there for something that they, that they love that the convention is offering. And that just means we have a future as fandom because uh, you have to have that kind of broadening as well as what you said, Jay, in terms of uh, welcoming a much more diverse audience, um, which has not always been the case. Alyssa, uh, I know we keep talking about the, the long ago times, but coming back to your experience from the art community, have you seen parallels? Um, I've been enjoying hearing about the history, honestly, because I didn't know any of it. Um, the art scene. Um, well, because I wasn't around for the early part of um, the art scene, it's a little bit hard for me to say, but I do see probably a lot of the same thing of you know, I think art as a profession long ago used to be a very male dominated uh, industry. And in some regions of it, it still is today. That's a big discussion in, in game development, uh, which I used to work in. But it's interesting because now, like, you look at art school demographics and it's mostly women. Like, I think when I was in school, it was like 60% 40, um, which is pretty wild because that's not actually reflected in the industry. But I do think it's changing as you look around um, the people who are making people who are um, like lead creators, like people who are making shows, people who are kind of making a name for themselves, they are a different set of people than you would have seen back when I was a kid and even probably what, five years ago. Like the change is happening very quickly and we're seeing it very, if you've been paying attention the last five years, you can kind of see it. So it's kind of amazing. Um, and I can only imagine that it'll start accelerating in the next 10 years or so as well. So I think the kinds of stuff that's gonna be created, the kind of art that's gonna come out it's going to be really exciting. Well, and I think we've seen this at conventions that have costuming as more movies, more comics, more books have a broader representation of people. Um, now you have kids dressing up like Black Panther. You have folks in uh, Wakanda outfits. You have uh, so many different characters to follow and see yourself in and representation matters. And the more the genre shows representation, the more the fans feel that it's their genre too. Which brings me to a problematic question, which is really kind of about gatekeeping, which we've run into at all different kinds of levels. Um, I'll give you an example. I was on a panel a number of years ago where it was about what would you recommend to somebody who was just getting into reading science fiction? And um, everybody on the panel went through all of these Silver Age classics from the 1930s and 40s. And I looked out at the audience that had people in their 20s and 30s. I looked at my panelists and realized I was the youngest person on the panel. And I said, guys, you haven't mentioned anything that was written since I've been born. So let's recognize that those might have been really precious to you because you read them when you were 12 and anything you read that year is, is precious for the rest of your life. 
reading it now to somebody is not going to hit the same way. It's got all kinds of problems. What do we recommend to somebody now? And that's just one type of gatekeeping. Of course, there's the whole who are the true fans and that sort of toxicity. But um, how do we bridge the gap between the, um, the generations and maybe the people who planted the flag and feel kind of territorial about being there first? Dan? I, th I think that's a really important question because uh, as I said, there, there have been a couple of cons where they've just sort of like brushed the older people aside. And I'm, you know, when I started going to conventions in the, in the 90s, and, and for many years thereafter, the big question was, the graying of fandom, we're getting so old, where are the young people? Well, the young people are coming now, and that's great, that's fantastic, but that doesn't mean you throw out the gray beards, like myself. Um, having something where you, you're reaching out to different things, like talking about, like my field, classic movies, I would love to do a panel. You know what? You know what? What movie? What are the essential science fiction movies? And have people of different ages. So where I'm talking about, say, you know, stuff stuff from the 1950s or 2001 or even the original Star Wars, somebody else might be talking about. Oh well, you know, we start with you know movies were invented with you know Iron Man or Black Panther, and I think we if we have those different perspectives, we can learn from each other, and that that's. That's, I think, the goal. Well, not to mention the fact that now that we have DVDs and online video, the whole canon is, is accessible to everybody in a way that it wasn't when you had to watch the movie in the theater or never see it again. Uh, you can binge the whole, all of Star Trek Next Generation uh, in a few days if you don't want to sleep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that changes things too, uh, Jay? Uh, one of the first conventions I attended as a as a speaker was PhilCon, and that was probably close to 15 years ago. And at the time, the, the people running PhilCon were very, very much very conservative. They wanted to preserve PhilCon as it has always been. And what you were talking about, Gail, about recognizing the Silver Age and all the classics as as the sacred library through which everything else is learned. It, there was a, a very strong resistance to change. And what I noticed was that my wife and I were probably the, some of the youngest people there and we were in our approaching 40. Um, and, and so I watched over the years, I think one of the most important things we can do is support programming like Balticon. These guys, they work their butts off all year long to make sure as many groups are represented and they have as many tracks as possible. And um, they ask for our advice, what should we do? And this is, I come to convention, I'm exposed to something I wouldn't have known, even even through talking to my kids. So making sure that, that convention programming is supported and making sure that, that different voices are heard. I don't need another Lovecraft uh, panel on what was cool back in the 30s. I want to know what Lovecraftian legacy I should be reading today and why didn't I hear about this before? So. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, I want to say that PhilCon has come a long way. I, I still have a fond sense of, of uh, memories of, of those conventions in my heart, but it's an example of how certain cons can go extinct if they continue to, to just celebrate the values of one small group. Uh, unfortunately, that they've come around. And I, that's, that's what I think. Alyssa? Well, did, what Jay was saying, I do like seeing a variety in the programming. When I, I was pleasantly surprised when I looked at the Balticon uh, lineup because I was like, oh, a lot of this stuff, I think I could understand it. I think I could be interested in it, even if I didn't necessarily know something about it. Because I have had those experiences where once I learned I could talk to other people about fantasy and sci-fi books, I was like, oh, let's try this. And then I didn't know what they were talking about because I hadn't read any of the books that they had read. And I was like, I felt bad about it because I wanted to talk to them about it, but I couldn't. Um, and I do think one method is also to focus on common themes um, that have stayed true through fantasy and sci-fi, the things that make people want to come back over and over again across generations. Because, yes, I have tried to read A Stranger in a Strange Land, which is a classic. And the female character in the first couple of chapters, I was like, I, I can't read this. Who is this? This is so weird. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot of, th sorry, I didn't get to finish that book. I couldn't do it. But no offense to anybody who loves it. I'm sure it's great. Um, but there are probably tons of common, there are probably tons of common themes in there that I could talk about somebody with if that's like what a panel was focusing on. 
like I think last year I watched something on murder mysteries in space and you could talk about book like books from the olden days or more like more classic books and then also stuff that's written now because people are still exploring all of those those storylines and it's great and that is an easy access point too because I'm like I like this one people seem like this one maybe it would work even if it's a little older. Well, folks, we have blown through our time. So very quickly, I'd love to have everybody say uh, where people can find you online. If you have something uh, new coming out or recently, uh, mention it and then uh, give a quick plug to your other Balticon uh, performances or, or panels. But uh, just got a few minutes. So uh, Dan, start us off. Please. All right, go very, go very fast. My most recent novel is Father of the Pride of Frankenstein. It's a comic novel. That doesn't mean it's, it's words. It's not a comic book, but it's I, I write humorous science fiction. Um, you can find me in the pages of Space and Time magazine at uh, my current reviews are at NorthShoreMovies.net. Um, I'm also on uh, Facebook and Goodreads. Awesome, Alyssa. Oh, and uh, I'm doing the Godzilla panel tomorrow. Okay, sorry about that, Alyssa. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I've got my coffee clutch at 5 30 eastern today um and then i also have my guest of honor presentation which is books and more tomorrow at 1 p.m eastern as well so stop on by if you want to it's a little it's a bit more of my life but there's book cover stuff too so and congratulations on being artist guest of honor thank you uh jay yeah first uh shout out to dennis in the chat yes I, you're one of the good ones at that con so thanks for all your hard work uh, I'm on a panel on setting policy for superheroes at 5.30, which will my HR nerd will be coming out at that panel. Uh, I've written a few books. If you go to jsmithaudio.com, there's a lot of free content. If you like that and want to buy one of my books, fantastic. Thanks for coming to the panel. I'm easy to find at gailzmartin.com and morganbrice.com. That's B-R-I-C-E. I'm on social media under those names. So if you search for me, you're likely to find me. I'm usually on Continual, which is a Facebook group and a, a, a website and growing out, uh, which is that ongoing uh, online convention. And I'm a staff writer for the Winchester Family Business blog. And uh, my latest, our latest book is Chicago Land, which is in the Joe Mack Adventures. It's 1929. Uh, Monster Hunter pulled in by Elliot Ness to deal with some of the occult mess left behind by Al Capone. So lots of fun and uh, kind of a little bit of uh, see those roaring 20s roar. Well, everybody, thank you so much for being wait, 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 amazing. Wait, wait, oh, yeah, yeah. We have like a, a minute or two left. I, got, I just have to throw this out because it, I, I think Alyssa is going to find this very bizarre. When I started going to convention in the 90s, one of the big things at conventions was the internet room where you could go to check your email. There's a whole room of computers where people would wait for their turn to go check their email. Uh, don't need that anymore. This is true. That this is true. Though. Well, thank you to our wonderful panelists. I think this is the kind of uh, conversation that could keep going all day long. Uh, and so many wonderful comments in the chat. And thanks to the Balticon programming gods for having us and for all the wonderful tech people behind the scenes who make this possible. And of course, thank you to all of you who are watching and listening because it's kind of pointless if you're not. So thank you for being here and thank you for having us and have a wonderful day. I have uh, two more panels this evening and four panels tomorrow. My latest panel at 730 is a reading. So come look for us and, and find us and hang out. Thank you so much. You're in Discord. <laughs>